This part is made out of heat treated stainless steel. And the hole you see in the front of it is just a little bit bigger than a human hair. But how's that possible? How can you get a hole so small in something so hard? Well, that's exactly what I'm gonna show you today on our Torno Swiss Nano. There are two things we need to consider when drilling a hole this small in this particular application. Number one is gonna be our RPMs, and number two is gonna be our locations. So let's focus first on the RPMs. So your RPM is gonna be based off something called your surface footage. And your surface footage is gonna be based off of what type of material you're running. Now we're cutting heat treated stainless steel and Micron who gave us these drills told us to run these drills at 60 surface footage. By the way, thank you guys, your products rule. So if you take 60 surface foot and you multiply it by 3.82 and then divide it by 8 thousandths, you'll get 28,650 RPM. Here's where you run into a little bit of a problem because the Nano's main spindle tops out at 16,000 RPM. Now that's still good, but it's only half of what we need for this particular application. So this is where the high frequency spindles come into play here. You'll notice I have two high frequency spindles underneath my counter spindle. You'll also notice there's an air line running to it and a power line running to it. The air line's just to keep back pressure. There's always a little bit of air, it sounds like, that's leaking out of these things. That's totally normal. It's just pushing air out so nothing can get in. The power line runs all the way back to the other side of the machine where we have our frequency converters. So at the back of the machine, we have our frequency converters. Now these things right here are hooked up to our high frequency spindles inside the machine. And all I have to do to turn these on is fire an M code. This is M890, this is M892. Now here's where you control your RPMs, right? And these things can go all the way up to 60,000 RPM. Like if I just hold this, it'll go all the way up to 60K. Now, I gotta really give Tornos a huge shout out here. I am really impressed at how streamlined their options have been. I mean, I've put these on other machines and it looks really bad. There's all these cables going all over the place. The fact these are just in the machine and nice like this is really impressive to me. Gotta interrupt the video real quick. Right now we have some insane deals that you are not gonna wanna miss on our Kenna Metal Mill 411 and our Mill 412 KT. Up to 60% off right now on our website, titansofcnctooling.com. Go check it out, we're practically giving them away. All right, back to the video. So we've talked about the RPM issues and what we have to do to reach the RPMs for these drills on this machine. Now let's go into problem two, which is our location. We have to locate these drills perfectly. And the reason why is because we have two drills. We have a pilot drill and we have our long drill. The pilot drill goes first and creates a guide for the longer drill. And if that guide is off in location at all, our longer drill, when it hits the side of it, will break. It has to be perfect. Take a closer look at this drill. You can see that the drill is only slightly bigger than the gaps between my fingerprint. And when carbide's this small, it's very brittle and very easy to break. Oh. Okay, so to my point exactly, these are not cheap and easy to break. Um, let's talk about the location strategy. Little disclaimer, we're about to get pretty technical here. So, I had to locate these two drills because we've gone over how important it is that they're perfectly on center. I don't have an indicator that can fit in my Nano, and I don't have a MOA deck to locate these two tools. So what can I do? Well, the answer to that is take a test cut, and that's exactly what I did. And this test cut looked like this. Now, this is the material diameter, so imagine this is the outside of our part. I put a pilot drill in both stations, and I sent them to X and Y of zero. This is supposed to be on center, and we're trying to figure out how far off this is actually gonna be. The next thing I did is I moved over to X of 50 thousandths and drilled another hole. Now we've given our vision system a clocking. It now knows where three o'clock is. After that, I came in with my turning tool and I kissed the face. This then tells us where the center of rotation of our spindle is. So with these three things, we can actually figure out how far off our tool station is. We now know where zero is, we now have a clocking, and we have a center of rotation. This will allow a vision system to give us a coordinate system and let us know how far off a center we are for both tools. So I mailed these customers these parts and I wanted to make sure they didn't get mixed up because this customer is gonna use a really, really accurate vision system to clock the part like I said and locate it like I said. And the last thing I want is for the holders to get mixed up. So I went and then I put an identification mark on there. The one dot is for tool 311 and the one with two dots is for tool 313. That way, I'm 100% positive the customer is measuring the right parts for the right holder and nothing gets mixed up. And after I got the results back from the customer, this is how much I had to move my holders to be exactly on center. 
The biggest number here on this screen is 1,002 tenths, but that's an X, which is diametrical, so it's actually half that. It's only six tenths off. And it is really incredible to me how close this really was. You know what else is incredible to me? You, Ben Jackson. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel and becoming a member. We really appreciate it here. You're helping support free education for all of manufacturing across the whole world. So thank you so much, buddy. You rule. All right, back to the video. This being only this far off is insane because there could have been a piece of dust under my holder. I could have over torqued a screw somewhere. There are a number of things that you can do to make something move that little. So I gotta hand it to you, Tornos. Your products rule. Sometimes in machining, you can just see where the tool's at. You can take a test cut, measure it accordingly, and adjust, and that's exactly what we did here. Other than that, the process is really straightforward. We start off by facing off, and it's really important that your tool's on center here. You do not wanna be off center at all. That'll absolutely break your drill. But then after we face off, we come in and we pilot drill and then drill. And here's where we pick up with the Horn R274 series and we continue turning. And I turn the part down to 14 thousandths, which is really crazy because the OD is 14 thousandths, the ID is 8 thousandths, which means the ring going around it is only 3 thousandths thick. It's really impressive to me that Horn makes a sharp enough tool to not just rip that apart, right? Because you would think something that thin would rip apart, but it's actually pretty strong. It could totally cut you, don't ask why I know that. After that, I just feed the part out, grab it with my counter spindle and cut it off. Then I go back to my sub side. And on my sub side, the first thing I do is I face off with the 105 series. Now I know this tool is looked at as like an internal tool for internal work, but the truth is I'm doing such small parts on this machine, you could totally use it for an OD tool, no problem. It's sharp enough, it's small enough, and that's kind of why I like it, because it gives you a whole bunch of room. If you put some giant tool in there, you could really run out of room quickly on this machine. There are all sorts of clearance issues when you're working on a Swiss machine. So the 105 series for OD work actually works pretty well on the counter spindle side. So next operation, we'll drill out the center of the part. And then after that, all I have to do is spot it and eject it. It ejects the part and it goes down to our little carousel option we got here. And there you have a completed part. The operations themselves were very, very standard, very, very basic. All we did was turn and drill on this part, but sometimes something as simple as drilling a hole could actually be really challenging because with a drill that's only 8 thousandths in diameter, we need to pilot and drill. These have to be perfectly aligned. And it may look simple on the outside, but when you do a process like this, all the things that go into making it work can be a real pain. So I'm glad I got to show you guys these kind of tricks. That is it for our video today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. We put a ton of effort into these videos. And subscribe, and don't be stupid, ring that notifications bell. See ya! So you might have noticed that in some of these shots we got really close to the drill and I wanted to show you what our editors had to go through to get this camera in there. I mean, it was insane. It's only a millimeter away from some of these castings as they're wrapping around. And even normally when you're not filming, the clearances in this machine are insane. You really have to pay attention. Stuff will miss things only by a millimeter. And it took a lot of work. So check out the setup because we put a ton of effort into this just to make you happy.